so I'm a little out of habit on hosting anything, so forgive me, but I do see cameras, so that makes me feel comfortable. Uh, but this is really, uh, this, is, this is a dialogue between the two of us um, that started in, in one of the offices of Sorensen Center earlier this fall, and we've, uh, we refined it a little bit last week, and now we can have it for, for public consumption. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Kathy Gannon, the uh, acclaimed uh, correspondent, uh, uh, epic record of the Associated Press uh, covering Afghanistan and Pakistan. I don't want to, uh, you know, I, I don't want to sell you short. Will you tell us, will you give us a short history? Will you tell us uh, the short version of the, of the beat? Yeah. Because you were in Afghanistan until earlier this year. Yes, I, I just left in May. Um, I left Afghanistan Amazing. in May. Um, I was there during the Taliban's first rule. And then I was there when they returned. And uh, so I've been covering Afghanistan really since the um, Soviets were in Afghanistan and when they left. Um, and uh, Pakistan, I also covered the um, uh, uh, war in South Lebanon and was in Northern Iraq for a while, did an embed with KKK, and then did uh, Central Asia, I covered uh, all the Central Asian states for a while as well, just as they uh, shuffled among different leaders and, and so, yeah, so, uh, and then I just left, uh, Afghanistan in May and I just left Pakistan in, um, August to start the fellowship here at the Shorency Center for the fall. Do you expect to be back? I will. I'll, yes, I will. As a matter of fact, I've been talking to, to several people. I'll be back in January. Um, I'm, doing um, a couple of books, but one book in particular that I want to do a little bit more mm -hmm. um, research on and revisit some areas. Um, so yeah, I'll be back in, in January and I do have a one-year visa and a, um, a work permit, which got me taken to Homeland Security when I arrived in, in Boston, I'll have you know. <laughs> yeah, so I spent a little time with Homeland Security at the airport. They should treat Canadians better. <laughs> So he was very nice. He was a very nice guy. And, you know, once we started talking about Afghanistan and and uh, the evacuation and some of the issues about the U.S. strategy or lack thereof in Afghanistan, it was it was actually quite an interesting conversation by the end of it. <laughs> and he did let me go, despite what I said about the strategy. <laughs> or lack or thereof. Lack. Yes, yes. Right. I said it's sort of like the definition of insanity. You keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. But. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, look, I'm just a, I'm a humble media reporter who who suddenly uh, got uh, put on vacation from CNN. So I, I'm here as a fellow this fall, like Kathy, and we started talking about something that's very fashionable in the media industry right now, very something that I talked a lot about on Reliable Sources, something that uh, you see just today on Axios, an article about a new pro-democracy media company that's launching to try to challenge Donald Trump and extremism in the GOP. It is very fashionable right now, right? We both see it, we all see it, to talk about journalists defending democracy, preserving democracy. We talk about having democracy beat reporters instead of political reporters, democracy reporters. We talk about what newsrooms should be doing to defend democracy against anti-democratic forces. And as uh, you know, all of that conversation and noise and attention is out there in the universe, Kathy, you have been talking about this in a, in a unique way. Uh, and at first I bristled at your argument and I panicked a little bit, and I, uh, uh, but the more I listened, the, 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 the more interesting I uh, became. So well, let's figure out what's the right starting point for it. It's, uh, it's that you've listened to all this coverage, you've heard all this commentary, and you've bristled at that. So tell us why. I, I do, because I, I feel so strongly about our industry and the value of our industry and the value of reporters. And um, democracy is a system of government, as is communism, as is authoritarianism, as is a theocratic government. It's a system of government, not my job to preserve it, uh, not my job. My job is to inform. It's for people, for uh, the politicians. My job is, is also, it's not about going out there with the intention of holding the, 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 the powerful to, to account. My job is to inform. If I'm going out for a specific uh, purpose or, or on a specific bandwagon, I actually, you actually undermine uh, democracy by the very uh, um, 
fact of losing your independence to promote a, a system of government. Um, your, your ability to question becomes um, handicapped. Uh, even to think of the questions. And then there's also the danger that comes with, well, if I ask that, will that uh, somehow seem to support the non-democratic forces? Uh, how do you define the non-democratic forces? Some people would say there is perhaps democracy in America, certainly not democracy in places where America has gone. Um, and um, the impact of America in other places, governments that have been overthrown, um, as, as we all well know in Chile, and a, a democratically elected government was overthrown for a, an authoritarian mm -hmm. government to be put in. Um, um, Iraq. Um, you know, the invasion of Iraq. That was by uh, a, a nation against another nation. Um, and so for me as a reporter, and, and, and I guess too, I also differentiate between um, commentators, although I think the public, it, it's, it's become very muddied. Um, so I think it's very right. difficult for the public, but I think it is so important that we maintain our independence. And once you, jump on a bandwagon and see yourself as the champion of democracy. That's not mm -hmm. to say you don't do stories about um, uh, um, uh, access to the ballot box, uh, access to um, voting rights, access to um, registration, access. Those are stories. Those are stories that should be told. Um, but it's not my job to preserve democracy. If I do my job, it might assist with freedoms, the free thinking, perhaps, you know, or perhaps not. Uh, um, but I don't write with the intention of accomplishing this. I write with the intention of informing. Mm. And I think you undermine democracy, or, or in my mind, it, it would undermine if we become this party to, it's a big world out there. Um, and I think it's, it's so important that we inform in the world in which we live, um, not propagate, and, and that's the difference. Mm. In the U.S., there's been this, this, uh, this reaction to Donald Trump, but also his allies, attacking the media, denigrating the media, trying to destroy news outlets. And a lot of the defense of democracy has come from that place of uh, there are certain forces trying to hurt American journalism, trying to erase it, and we are going to defend the existence of what we do and stand up against that. Uh, now, you face that in a much more uh, hostile way in, in, in these war zones, where there are obviously folks who are against journalism and don't want you there. So when you look at the American reaction, the American reaction to a very different situation, this hostile former president, what did we get wrong? What did we do wrong in those years? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't, I, it's not for me to say this was wrong, this, but somebody wants to attack us, that's fine, not my business. It's, it's, it's not about, it's not about me. And, and it just got about responding to everything that was said about the media. Frankly, say whatever you want, I don't care. I mean, but if it's not a story, then um, for me, I, I was really kind of shocked at the coverage, not shocked, shocked is the wrong word, but surprised at what was seen as a story mm -hmm. that for me, I just didn't understand where the, 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 the story was. What was the value? What were you informing? What were you, um, it was, well, you know, they're saying this about the media. They're saying, who cares? People can say whatever they want, not my business. And, and our job is not an easy one. It's not meant to be um, uh, open, open arms and open doors and, and if they closed the door on us, my goodness, there was so much coverage of the fact that Donald Trump didn't want to attend the uh, White House Foreign Correspondence Center. Like, who cares? You know, I mean, I just, I guess for me, and, it, and it's just as, as a reporter, um, I, I, I'm not bound to respond to everything somebody says. Um, and it doesn't matter that it's the president of the United States. Um, if there's a story there, as, as you were saying the other night about all of the streets and that, and, and how do you uh, respond? How do you cover? Well, then you tell the larger story. 
um, of um, uh, social media, the impact of social media, the impact of, of uh, um, 80 characters, 120 characters, and and sure. how that. So so, but your mind isn't even open to that if you're always wanting to respond to what is, who's attacking you mm -hmm. and and respond to that idea. So I, independent thought is key. But then this gets to whether journalism can function in other systems of government, right? Uh, Donald Trump would prefer a much more authoritarian system of government according to his own behavior. Uh, journalism, I think what many journalists would say is, how, how would we function in that environment? We need to have a flourishing democracy. Dick Toefel, former ProPublica executive, has said, journalism is pro-democracy because democracy is pro-journalism. You can't unhook the two. And to that you say hogwash. No, to that I say, <laughs> to that I say by, by uh, um, linking the two, you've undermined both, both the, the, that system and journalism mm -hmm. and, and made our credibility uh, subject to um, a, a great deal of questioning and a great and 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 understandably so. Um, is it easier to do journalism when nobody bothers you? Absolutely, one hundred percent, no question. But there are people doing journalism around the world and in difficult circumstances. Are they doing it in a way that you might know or I might know? But they are, and they're doing it at the right. local level in many countries right. um, in Afghanistan. Is it easy? No, absolutely not. But there are still people getting up every morning, going out, doing an interview, being mm. turned away, going back. Try and we did such a disservice, I think, mm. Brian. And disservice maybe is the wrong choice of words, but it, um, when um, journalism emerged in Afghanistan, or, or uh, emphasis on journalism mm -hmm. uh, began in Afghanistan post 2001. Mm -hmm. I think it was uh, for for Afghan journalists, they were somehow led to believe that they were part of this mission, this coalition mission. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I, I believe the the mm -hmm. uh, coalition and uh, encouraged that and 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 made them feel that somehow you can't do journalism when there's another system. So we better go because ah. we can't. Or, or and, you know, and we stop might, doing it. Hmm. Yeah, or we might be in danger, and it might be very difficult. And no question, Brian, it it, it can be very difficult to do journalism. And I and I accept that. And I, I accept that under Trump, that there were tremendous difficulties, and people who had never felt threatened before suddenly felt threatened. We felt that we have to react, and then react to other journalists that were maybe supporting Trump. And then it became a um, a food fight. Well, a bit of a food fight, but all under the banner of, of, of us, of journalism and, and us doing our jobs. When, mm -hmm. when for me, I think we compromised um, our independence and our mm -hmm. independence of thought. Are we objective? No. I've got my, when I put a lead on the story, I'm, I'm looking at it from my, but I want to be independent. I want to have the independent of thought mm -hmm. where Questions can come to my mind. I'm not judging you. I'm not judging you. I'm not um, out to support democracy. I'm not out to hurt democracy. I'm out to inform. I want to know more. I want to understand. I want to question. But you can't have that open curiosity when you're sort of in the back of your head, well, maybe I better not ask that question. You know, it might look like, uh, it might look like I'm supporting um, uh, anti democratic policies, mm. or um, I spoke to a, a Neiman fellow recently, just recently, and she was just talking about you know doing stories in uh, one area uh, where she was working, and she wanted to do a little bit different uh, stories and maybe question a little bit more, and uh, and she had to say, and she kind of looked over her shoulder like uh, by saying this she was questioning democracy because a lot of the stories that she was doing were democracy and she just said some of the pro-democracy forces really had a lot of layers that maybe were needed to be better understood and better the story told and so but she felt that she couldn't tell those stories and she felt that she had to say but you know I support democracy really I mean I'm not you know so and to me immediately we have compromised and 
and our compromise, not ourselves, but our ability. Um, has it been, uh, what's it been like being in the U.S. in the last few months and consuming American media? Because you're bringing this wonderful international correspondent perspective to this battle that we're having in the U.S. where this midterm election, a lot of the arguments about the midterms were who's for democracy and who's against democracy. Yeah, you know, Brian, it, it, such a good question um, because it's been really interesting for me to um, to be here and to um, to to read and to um, and how uh, things are phrased and and battles are fra are phrased the Republicans and the Democrats and the the whole election um, and there is some wonderful journalism that goes on. There's no question because your your critical doesn't for a moment suggest that that, that there isn't, mm -hmm. um, but it's become almost like team reporting now on this team or on this team or team, team democracy, team uh, <laughs> liberalism, team this, team. And, yeah. and I think it really undermines our, well, it does undermine our credibility, um, you know, because people now are s suspicious or, well, maybe that's not true. And it opens the door for this whole fake news um, raising or whatever uh, or attack. Um, because we have become emotionally involved mm -hmm. and we're not emotionally involved. Um, and I'm not, I, I mean, it, it's, it's not my job to protect democracy. It is not my job to, in Afghanistan, to tell the story from the American perspective, from the Canadian perspective. From, my job is to try to understand that country. And in some cases, it's where there is U.S. involvement for the Canadian. Um, many cases, it's not. Um, and and so, I guess for me, it's it's um, it's really been very good. It's been it's been a a, a, a really good experience for me. And I, I think we would do ourselves as reporters um, to to think beyond borders and to think a little bit more about um, how we perceive ourselves and, and as a result of how we perceive ourselves, how we perceive others, because that mm -hmm. then affects how you tell a story mm -hmm. and even how you're able to question. Because if you're already going into something with judgment, as a lot of reporters do, going into um, what the Republicans say, and uh, this one supported by Donald Trump, and look at that, that one lost, so that means Donald Trump doesn't have the support. And I'm trying to think, well, what, what else does it mean? It must be more than that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got to mean much more than that. And and so I feel mm -hmm. that we are undermining that very um, system of government or, or that 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 um, it, it, some seem so anxious to be a part of saying we preserve it. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not sure if that makes it, it does, I, but I think I think that the tension of the last uh, seven years, but let's say the last couple of years, even after Trump left office, uh, you know, on, uh, barely. I mean, he, he pretended to have won the election. Is that uh, in the United States, we're, as reporters, we're not used to that that level of lying from elected officials or people seeking office. We're we're used to yes, a certain level of lying, of course, and. We can all go back and talk about examples of that throughout history. But to be in an environment where there's reality denial, the denial of who won in a lost election, of uh, crazed conspiracy theories like QAnon, there's a level of reality distortion that we are all still getting coming to grips with. And maybe that's not true in other countries, but I think in the US it's been, it's been a, a, a tumultuous time because of that level of reality denial. And that has caused, to get to our title, some journalists who want to be on the side of decency and democracy to try to defend reality, in other words, right? Now, I, I'm not saying that's successful or it's been working or it's right, but it, it feels to me like that is the X factor. That's what's caused these conversations, this level of reality denial. Yeah. I, I, think, I think you're right, but I, I think maybe this is good for, for huh? um, the, the, the U.S. media because, frankly, um, and, and I'm, I'm, of course, Donald Trump was was a phenomenon, 
that many people will say is a symptom of a much deeper uh, um, uh, uh, um, series of divisions and, right. and, and right. thought processes and everything that is, has goes back very far in, in U.S. history. And, yes. and maybe this is good for, 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 for the U.S. media to, to be more open to questioning, you know? I mean, a lot of people were probably lying to them before, and, and you just assume the bar was too high, you know? I mean, like, somehow they were, they were his, his level of lying was so much greater. Uh, if you are in uh, Central and South, if you were in Central and South America and listening to the lies being told in America about what was being done in Central and South America, um, and as a result of not questioning, those, um, those really difficult situations that were created in these countries by officials here may have been uncovered much earlier, may have had much more exposure, if the questioning would have been more um, intense, more critical, the minds would have been more opening to say, well, you know, I mean, just because the Secretary of State has said, and, mm. you know, he's the Secretary of State somehow is a certain level and so would not um, do below that, um, and 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 it's not to say that that uh, um, uh, people uh, that that they would. It's just to say you will look at another country and another um, uh, um, defense department official, and you will be very critical, and you think, well, she's not that bad. Uh, mm -hmm. But your own, you'll say, well, you know, we 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 assume a certain level of honesty, and I'm not sure that that evidence is really there to justify those assumptions. I think there has been a tremendous amount of lying. Has Donald Trump been much, was Donald Trump much more without the um, the sophistication? With yeah, the, there was sure. a brazenness and a sense. I think, I, think, I think the bar has been put very high mm. for officials within the United States of America, whereas those same officials in another country you'll be far more critical of. But you, there is a certain level of assumption that there is a truth that is there. And Donald Trump somehow blew that apart. Mm. And in many ways, maybe if reporting would have been less about everything that came out of that man's mouth that had nothing to do with, with, with a news value, um, but the box was saying this, and so this one had to say mm -hmm. that, and that one had to say this. And, and suddenly, that is the news. And I'm thinking, but it's not news. Mm. I, mean, uh, I think you're what you're coming up against, in my humble opinion, is the, the 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 perverse reality of media and central structures today. That what's trending on Twitter is what millions of people see, and it's not. I agree that it's not news per se, but it's what millions of people are seeing, and thus it influences them. Or what Tucker Carlson says at night on Fox is not news per se, but millions of people are seeing it, and so it influences the dialogue, and in many cases poisons the dialogue. And so much of what we see on our screens and what becomes nightly news material, you know, is, is far removed from on the ground reporting and from the scrutiny that you're describing. But it's in part because of these social media echo chambers and, and partisan media echo chambers where we live in, where I, I, that's why I would argue that a lot of what Trump was saying or pick, pick your candidate, whatever they're saying, whatever goes viral, is, is worth scrutinizing because it's reaching millions of people outside of the media, outside of the newsroom system. And that gets to, you know, who sets the agenda, how much influence do newsrooms have over, uh, you know, what people are talking about, et cetera. And that's why it's so refreshing to hear you describe it, you know, after, after you know, living this and, and also, you know, looking at the U.S. involvement around the world. I mean, I think what you're also hitting at is, correct me if I'm wrong, the way that Western news outlets approach the West's foreign policy decisions and the assumptions that are made in a lot of that news coverage, uh, even something as simple as whether you call it the war in Iraq or the invasion of Iraq, right? I mean, even the language, think about the language used around Russia's invasion of Ukraine versus U.S. actions in other countries. Absolutely, you're absolutely right, Stephen, in, in, in terms of the, the scrutiny of U.S. policy and thought. 
Um, but I think also as reporters, and, and, and social media has a tremendous filter, and it reaches a tremendous number of people. But once you become part of that uh, chorus or, or part of that noise, that's all you are is part of that noise. Mm. You're not informing anymore. You're just part of the noise. Well, you know, this this one is saying this. Uh, Tucker Carlson is saying that. It's, you're, you're, you're not informing anymore. So that people are, are and, and, and you're absolutely right that, that uh, Carlson, for example, reaches a lot of people. Um, and other, uh, CNN reaches a lot of people. And, and, but it's become so much a part of this noise and not a part of informing anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got to counter what this one is saying. And I have to because it's, it's reaching millions of people. And so, and now the people now are just part of your back and forth with each other mm -hmm. and, and not being informed, but taking sides. Well, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, Brian's making a good point. Well, you know, Tucker Carlson, he's making a good point. And it's not informing anymore. It's now being uh, presenting uh, uh, one, one side or the other. And so you're not informing to let people decide. You're deciding for them. Our job is not to say, uh, uh, this one's not right, this one. Our job is to inform so that the, the reader has enough information that says, you know, I, I, I didn't think of that. Or, or, but we've stopped even that thought process mm -hmm. from the people. Now all the people, or I, I think, I think a lot of people now, they just think, oh, you know, that's the liberal press. Well, that's a conservative press. Even something as, for me, very basic, and, and I know it's in tradition and everything, mm -hmm. for a newspaper to come out and report on the very concept of reality, it, it's mind-boggling. I, I, really, it is. I mean, all these editorial board endorsements. Yes, yeah, last month, yeah. It's just because the reader can't differentiate. Well, so I write a story, but my paper has said, uh, well, we're supporting this right. candidate. And so everybody knows that this paper supports this candidate, but I'm writing and I'm trying to inform, but <laughs> it informs the public. The, the, the fact that newspapers editorial boards uh, openly endorse a candidate informs the public that that organization, that news organization, is coming from that political point, that political standpoint. That impacts how they read the paper. Mm. And so that is very important if you're going to have a candidate. And by all this jumping on this bandwagon and with this one, all I think that has happened is that the public is much less informed mm. and much more opinionated. Well, I think that they're really good. Well, I think they're not very good. And so <laughs> the polarization has just even increased in, in my mind. I, I think that that's been the end result. Mm. And that's why I feel so strongly because of this profession that I've been doing for way. <laughs> 50, and, and, it, and it's an important, it, it is important because I do believe people want to know what is going on. I believe they want to be informed. And, and language and words are important. Um, and for way too long, it was okay to refer to what in other countries are just torture cases. Yet what the U.S. does or did as enhanced interrogation. Um, that's, I give that just as an example of how we misinform mm. when our job is to be to inform. We misinform because we, in a, well, you know, it's, it's okay. Don't do that. Not, you know, and, and of course, some bad countries are bad. I mean, we're a democracy. But in fact, mm. that's exactly what happened. And so at our lack of informing our uh, uh, jumping on that bandwagon has, has undermined, in my mm. mind, and does undermine um, the, the very system that, that uh, um, people want, presumably, or, mm. you know, so. Or expect to have, right, yeah. right. I think it'd be a lot of fun to open it up and, and hear what you all re say and react and feel. Uh, do we need to use the mic or can we skip it? Um, do we need? Okay, well, we'll use the mic. Hang on for a second. We'll go to you first, but let's bring the microphone over to the live. 
Thank you very much, uh, Kathy, and uh, thank you, Brian. Beautiful. Uh, my name is Jamil. Uh, I was also a former journalist. I used to work at the BBC Health Service. Uh, I was also teaching journalism, and I find this discussion quite fascinating. Um, I have a triangular question or a comment, and I would like to really to hear the perspectives of both of you. Uh, you remember Edmund Bock, who was credited to making the statement about the fourth estate while speaking at the British Parliament, and he referred to the three arms of government, and he said in the gallery yonder, where the press is sitting, that is the fourth estate to keep a check on us. So from that perspective, don't you think that the history of journalism and democracy were intertwined? And perhaps there is a duty from that perspective for media to defend democracy. That's one part of the argument that kept coming to my mind when you were speaking. But the second point also is to flip the coin when democracies themselves feel threatened by the media itself and they try to control the media. And a very good example that comes to mind is when Donald Rumsfeld walked into the uh, correspondent room ahead of the invasion of Iraq and came up with the idea of embedding journalists so that they can control what the media brings out. So in this case, what should the media do? But the third part is, which I found very fascinating about your argument, is the idea of professional journalism, which you are advocating where, yes, don't tell us what to do, and it's our, not our duty to opinionate. So it seems there is a complexity here that is that we need to unearth in our discussion about the role of uh, media on whether to preserve democracy or not to preserve democracy. I go first? I mean, I'll tell you what comes to my mind about the first part of your question. Uh, which is, um, you know, the, the fourth estate and the roles of the fourth estate. And, and I would preface by saying there's lots of types of journalism, right? And the type of journalism that, that Kathy, you were so well known for, uh, you know, textured, um, you know, on the ground, nuanced coverage, talking to actually, you know, people actually involved in the story, you know, which is an in-depth report. There is that, which is often, you know, very rightly held up as, as, the, as the best of the best. There's lots of other forms of journalism, right? There's just a you know, news alert about a car accident. There's a weather report, but there's also you know, an election projection. Who won a race, you know? And, and that is, um, it's, it's not gonna, win a, not gonna win an award, but it's still valuable. And I think this week is a really interesting example of that. Uh, when the major networks and the AP call races, when we project winners of elections, um, that has a democracy supporting function. Whether that's the intent or not, you know, I'm not saying that preserves democracy. But when last night uh, all the networks in the AP called Arizona uh, for Katie Hobbs over Carrie Lake, Carrie Lake, one of the most prominent election deniers in the country, very worrisome to think about her having power in Arizona, uh, but came very close. Uh, even Fox had to admit that she lost, and that was based on a projection. You know, it'll take weeks before that she'll give up, and maybe she never will. Maybe she'll pretend she won forever. But to me, the networks in the AP have a really valuable democracy supporting function by counting votes and oversee, look, looking at the, no, they don't, they don't count, but you know, they, they're in there pulling all the data together, analyzing the data, uh, making sure they're at 99.9 .9 whatever percent confidence in the data, and then making a projection. And most people in 2020, and again this year, go along with it, and we all accept it. Uh, most Republicans this year have accepted the losses. Um, as well as the wins. And I think that's an interesting function of media. And it's not the same as, it, it's not an explicit attempt to defend democracy, but by doing the job correctly and fairly and carefully, it is a defense of democracy, right? Does that, does that make sense? Like to me, that's a role of the fourth estate. It's not, uh, it's not the hold truth to power, show up at the state house, challenge the leaders, but it, it is providing information to the public and upholding democracy in that small way, in that function. I think we see that, we see lots of those functions that we take for granted. 2020 helped us not take them for granted uh, when, when the big lie emerged. Um, but to me, that's what comes to mind thinking about what, what are the granular steps media takes on a daily basis um, to, uh, to show how the democracy is functioning or not. Uh, and that's an example. But you have some broader questions too for you. No, no, I, I think that's very interesting. No, I don't think it's in support of democracy. 
I think what it is is in support of truth. AP <laughs> only declares when they and they they've they've even come out with yeah. with, with how with the model stories, works, yeah. how yeah. it is done. Right. So you are informed as the reader, um, as the viewer, that here is how it is done. Not about uh, supporting democracy. Not about it's a system of government. That's the system that is going on in the United States of America today. It, it is that system, and here's how it works. That's what you're being told. You're the reader. And, and here, um, in terms of Arizona, right down until it was impossible with the numbers for the other side to avoid. So really, for me, and, and, I, and I really do feel strongly, and I'm, I'm such a big fan of, of AP, obviously, because I work for them forever, but, but, but also because it is about truth. It's not about saying this is mm -hmm. the right one, the wrong one, the good one, the bad one. The, the, it's about saying here's how the system works, because it is a system, um, and here's how we're telling you right. that these two candidates, and here was the, the voting pattern. Here's how the votes came down. Here's the counts. Here's how we counted. Here's how... And now, because it is impossible, given the number of voters, given the, the votes that, that are there, for this other candidate in this particular election to win. So it's really, it's, it's, it's not in support of, this is the system that's going on in America. This is the system. So as a reporter, it was informing, and that's what our job is. I don't care that a politician says we're there to hold, you know, us to, you know, to really, they're the ones who hold us accountable. Oh, please, you know. I mean, first we 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 should be challenged on that because it, it, just by not holding, uh, uh, you know, when we we believe that that there's the assumption of lies is more likely coming from Donald Trump and not from uh, I'd say another, but I, I won't. But you know, from another side or another. That's not our job, and and our job is to really be critical in how we report regardless and not to make those assumptions because then we can't question critically. Um, I, you know, I mean, uh, it's, what I do is a job. I, my job is to inform. I'm not some public service on a mission. Um, there are activists who protect uh, uh, freedom of the press and there are those are activists and I, and I, I believe strongly in them and I, I think they're, they're amazing. The, Committee to Protect Journalists, so many organizations, but really they work so hard to, to advocate on behalf of journalists. But as a practitioner, as a reporter, my job is to inform. And I have to be have that independence of thinking so that regardless of whether it's in America mm -hmm. or whether it's in Afghanistan or whether I'm talking to the Taliban or whether I'm talking to... Um, Biden or whether I'm I'm going into it with the, the, the curiosity that that it doesn't matter who who you are that you know you're the president of the United States so I guess I have to look at you a different way or say this or I have to no I, I have to have the curiosity and and for that I need to have independence mm -hmm. and so it it's very important important to me I say whatever they want. I don't care. Politicians can do whatever they want. That's that's what they do. They, you know, some of them lie. Some of them don't. Some of them go into it, make make money. Some of them go into it because they can't do any other job. I, I mean, but that's that's their business. My business is to inform as best I possibly can by going out into wherever and, and you know, um, like Arizona and everybody's going on about it. And that's very interesting. For me, it's very interesting. Um, it was very close race, and so what does that mean? And how, I, you know, right. a lot of the details I, I I I don't really hear or, or or read because it's just well, Democrats have taken it, you know, and so now it's over, <laughs> you know. Mm. Well, yay, good news, or you know, or oh, too bad, and and all that information that just is mm -hmm. so interesting to me um, is 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 not there, it, or at least I haven't uh, um, read it 
and, and of course they just mm -hmm. made the call and, and that. So so I come at it from a little bit differently. Um, I, um, I, I do believe that our independence as reporters is extraordinary independence. And that's why I feel that if we for any moment feel that our job is anything more than to inform and question with wide open curiosity um, that we do a disservice to our job and then to the, the readership and to the viewers. But Brian's also right. The, there, there's all kinds of media people that are commentators, opinion makers, or, you know, um, and that's, that's a whole different, I think that gets lost on the public. Right. But that's right. where I think news organizations like newspapers, it's incumbent on them not to come out in support of a, a, a candidate because it is important that the perception, you know, it's like conflict of interest. It, you have to be perceived to be, you know, when they say, well, yeah, I'm going to talk to the candidate, but it's the perception you have to also be perceived to be uh, independent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, who has the microphone? Just, oh, let's pass it along. Let's pass it down the line. We can just go straight down the line. That's perfect. <laughs> perfect. Okay, so you say that it's not the role of the media to defend democracy and rather to inform um, and also to make sure that that independence of thought is is there. But is there, you know, is there a is there a role to preserve an environment, not democracy, not any kind of system of government, but an environment where that independence of thought is able to flourish or an environment where, um, you know, your important role to inform is not impinged on in any way, or is that rather the role of you as a citizen and not necessarily as a reporter? And the role of the reporter is no matter how suffocating the environment to just to keep going. And kind of how do you land on yeah. on that separating it, separating democracy, but just kind of so that freedom of, of right. movement and freedom of um, you're, 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 it, it's that's a, a, a very good question. And um, as a reporter, um, it's, it, it makes it easier for me to do my job. When I don't, I, I'm I'm not being you know followed, and I'm not being threatened, and I'm not being, of course, it makes it. But so many of us still do that job, and in so many countries of the world, and in so many different ways, and and that it's not an easy job. I don't for a moment mean to 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 at all suggest that this is a, an easy job. It's a very difficult job, and in some countries it's it's more difficult, and at sometimes in in different countries it's more difficult than at other times. But that doesn't make it, um, it any less, uh, um, doesn't change what our role is. It just means it maybe is a little more difficult to do it. Um, you have to find different ways to do it. Um, for example, I, you know, I, this was when the Taliban were first in power and I was in Afghanistan and I wanted to do this interview. And I was just determined I was going to do this interview. I spent six hours sitting outside this guy's office until he was so embarrassed he had to let me in. And he was clear. Now, would it have been easier if I could have seen him in the first five minutes? And he was willing to talk to the male photographer. And I said, no, he's a photographer. I'm a reporter. And I sat there. I sat there. I had to sit at the other end of the room. And he got, fine, I don't mind. I don't care. I got to ask my questions. I got to do my interview. I got. Was it easy? No. But it was important because this was uh, Chief Justice. It was an interesting case. It was. I, I needed to hear uh, what, what he had to say. So, yes, the environment in which we work, it, if, if it can be easier, yay. But that also doesn't mean that um, it, it's not my job to make that environment. My job is to work within the environment. And, and in America, I think journalists um, uh, found in the previous uh, uh, administration difficulties that they hadn't encountered before or hadn't hadn't thought about as much before. Um, so, and, and so in some ways, I think this is very good. Maybe it's a very good awakening for, for journalists here because the job is not easy and, and you will have people lying to you and you will have uh, um, people who are, are, you know, blustering and, 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 and you have to figure out how do you tell the story and how do you, you, you do your, your job. So, um, I'm not sure I answered that question, but I rambled a lot. <laughs> mm 
you, Brian and Cassie. My name is Ariel and I'm a graduate student at uh, HKS. My question for you is around media and social media. And I feel like the, the, the line between the two are very blurry right now, right? A lot of people read their news on social media. So interested on your take in terms of media's role in the era of social media. So now I think a lot of people are having this um, criticism on social media in terms of actually destroying the democracy because of misinformation and all of that. So what's your take on that as we kind of evolve how people consume the news and, and media? You go first. Uh, look, I, I think we will look back in 50 years and we're going to see so many studies from Harvard and elsewhere where 2010, 2011, 2012 was a turning point for so much in our society. We're going to find it about how children developed. We're going to find it about how our brains have changed. We're going to find all these changes and they're all going to trace back to Twitter and Facebook. Uh, and some of them, have already, we've already seen some of that research. I mean, it's happening actively, right? You can see it in the leaks from Facebook about Instagram, about what it's done uh, to young women's portrayal. Well, I, I do blame the, it is the, it is Steve Jobs' fault. That's right. Yep, 2007. Yep, it is, it is Steve Jobs' fault uh, because he put these in our pockets and our phones and our hands and then they created social networks for us to spend all day on. I, I mean, I, I really, I do deeply believe that. Uh, but look, it is the environment. We have to reckon with it. It's it's not going to change. The phones aren't going to go away. They're only going to get more powerful. Uh, we have to live in this environment. And uh, the problem that you identify about the blurring between uh, uh, reporters on the ground and commentators in the studio and partisans on social media is only going to get blurrier. And, and I, I don't know of ways to make it less blurry. Um, look, I'm, I think about times at CNN where I was doing I was reporting one minute and literally the next minute I was commenting, right? I mean, you know, you can, in theory, it would be wonderful to try to split all that apart. In reality, I see no way to do it. Uh, and I'd love to be proven wrong. Um, mm. So uh, I do think all that traces back to Steve Jobs and the iPhone and thus the invention of these social networks. Uh, but we then have to, I think there's two sets of, of uh, constituencies then. Journalists have to, figure out the best best ways to in, exist in that environment. And then everybody using those services has to, has to know what they're doing on those services. I do think the meltdown at Twitter may have some silver linings, right? Hopefully we're gonna see some something new flourish. We're gonna see new alternatives pop up. Hopefully that'll be a good thing. Uh, on, on, and I am interested in what the Times and other outlets have done trying to discourage journalists' social media use, um, trying to at least tamp it down. Uh, especially around Twitter, which is addictive in, 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 in so many ways. Um, that probably, you know, it may be too little too late, but it's probably worth the experiment. I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it, it, Brian's so right. I mean, I think we're going to find out so much more as, as the years go by. And and um, um, and I think AP has a very, has had for years, a very strict policy. Very, it was, it was no, nobody wants your opinion on anything. Mm -hmm. You cannot give your opinion on it. Um, so, so there's that, but I, I think you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. But I think also there are some things that the, the reporters can do because we are still reporters. It's, it's, um, for example, and this is, there was a, the, talked about this story on, on, um, Pelosi's husband and, and all, you know, well, people are saying this, well, people are saying that and, and, and then making that into a story I, I, because it's out there. It, but it's not a story. The more you could tell the story about um, social media, and and if you want to get into and peel the layers away about how you know people are using it, and and turn it into something that that informs people on um, the 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 um, lies coming out of social media or the impact or you know that kind of thing. So the reader is is like you, challenging and the oh yeah, that's right, as opposed to us as reporters getting right into the fray and, and, and regurgitating what's on social media and regurgitating what's on Twitter and regurgitating what uh, this, this outlet says and that, that outlet says and not giving it, um, a, a, giving it a news value when it is a news value, not just because it's out there. And that's become very difficult. This is where we disagree on Pelosi. It, it, I, I think the fact that so many Republicans wanted to believe crazy lies about Pelosi's husband 
is a symptom of a, of a disease that we need to study and understand. It, um, studying it, and I'm not sure it's Republicans. See, then it becomes this team thing. Again. Well, I don't know of any Democrats that made up those crazy but, but lies. We just, but, but we don't know. That's what I, all I'm we saying. Can, we can say with 99% confidence that it was but, conservatives. But when you, when you do, but then lies. you have to do a study and to say, as a reporter, you have to do a study. You have to know. Otherwise, it's just uh, um, feeding the, the frenzy as opposed to in any way giving people information that then they can make a choice. Yeah, well, gee, I didn't realize that. Well, yeah, that's not for me to say that this is a Republican ploy or this is, you know, um, and, and holding the Democrats above all of that or, or it, it, again, and, and I'm not saying that you're wrong because you might very well be absolutely right, but all I'm saying is that my job is, that's not my job. My job is to look at it and say, Okay, you know, I mean, this is really that 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 somebody is attacked of that significance, mm -hmm. and and they were looking for Pelosi, and this is, but to repeat things just because they're out there, um, and then to try to say that this then is is reflective of of a Republican mindset or of a a, um, a, a party uh, affiliation links that I. I I, I, I just feel there where we're not informing, we're just mm -hmm. jumping on that same um, bandwagon, or not bandwagon, mm -hmm. that's the wrong word. And to give jumping. oxygen, yeah. And, 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 and without giving any information, it's really just giving oxygen to a lot of uh, uh, rumors. And well, I heard that so-and-so was, oh, well, wasn't there some sort of, you know, I mean, I could say something out of the blue and come, oh, well, that's what I said, and then nobody else, and then suddenly that's, that's something. Um, and I, I think, our job is even more difficult than ever before because of social media, and because it's like, so rightly to point out about the blurring, but our job is even more important that we are independent, that we are challenging the um, uh, accepted, you know, well, this is, it must be them or must be them. You know, I just think that it's become even more important for us to really be that much independent so we can really peel away those layers and not get into the fray and become part of that noise. We have one more? Yeah. I'm uh, Jason Munyon, a graduate student at HKS. Kind of related to this last uh, discussion, um, there's a tradition in the U.S. with elections of the October surprise. Yeah. So shortly before the weeks leading up to the election, then uh, a campaign releases juicy dirt to try to catch a candidate off guard, it gets hard for them to uh, rebut the allegations, and that's what's on the mind of voters that go to the polls. So you could say that this last election, there's a Herschel Walker and the abortions is, could be considered an October surprise. And the last presidential election, there was the Hunter Biden tapes, or the laptop, I'm sorry. And um, you know, at the time, there had the hallmarks of Russian interference in the, in the election. And so the New York Post was blocked from uh, from Twitter because they had broken that story and they, they were blocked for reporting that. And um, it was not given a lot of coverage because it was considered that uh, maybe this was interference or these are, aren't authentic. Since then, now we know that the emails were authentic. Um, what do you think is the right way to handle these kinds of situations like the Hunter Biden laptop or other situations where there isn't much time necessarily to verify or to investigate this kind of information? Should there be a pause that we don't um, disclose them at all, or should we disclose them with a lot of caveats? What do you think is the right way to handle this, these kinds of situations? Um, well, I think um, if you can't verify, you can't report. It's as simple as that. If you can't verify, you can't report. Um, if you have the um, a, a leader that's saying something, and you can't verify it, and it impacts something, then you have to you have to be able to do sufficient reporting or do your reporting um, so that you're able to give the reader the information that is 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 there that that okay here's what is um i have to say the uh, biden hunter biden left i mean i i'm familiar of course but i was really busy in afghanistan <laughs> so um so you know i mean I, but i think of course you know i mean it's 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 um there's a news value in that that there is that impacting an election campaign. Uh, and this is the reason why he's the son of a candidate in the election. Um, and 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 people can understand that. I mean, 
and then you can, if, if you don't have verifiable information about um, whether or not the um, uh, material on the laptop or that it was, then then I you if you can't verify, you can't report. You don't get to say, well, but you know, so and so said, so I just said what uh, so and so said. Now you you. It's impacting an election. That's this whole story. I mean, because the story wasn't frankly about Hunter Biden. It was about Hunter Biden because he's the son of President uh, President Biden. So there's your story. I mean, that is the story. I mean, the, the rest was just a lot of detail about. So so that's what you're talking about. That's the story. And and how does that impact the election? And it, does it impact the election? Is it going to? Um, uh, how is it being used by this one? How is it being used by that one? Um, it, how is it impacting? Is it impacting? Well, it's not impacting. Uh, you know, uh, uh, that that is all information that you can give by doing your reporting on that subject. Our job is not, again, and I know I said it, but it, it's not an easy job. It's not, it, 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 you really have to do a lot of work in terms of trying to find the answers, trying to talk to people, trying to find out what, what's, uh, what the details are, what, uh, uh, who's it impacting, how's it impacting. And those are all important questions that you need to be able to try to answer, but you have to be thinking independently enough that you're, you're, you're able to even come up with all that, those questions and have all that curiosity. Otherwise, it's easy to just say, well, you know, it's this or it's that. I would just say Twitter shouldn't have blocked the link. Um, we're at time, so we will wrap it up there. I want to thank folks on the live stream who tuned in uh, and on Zoom. And thank you, Kathy, for the dialogue. Thanks for getting us thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I have